Good evening. Welcome to uh, the first Wigtown Wednesday of 2022. Uh, my name is Adrian Turpin. I'm the Artistic Director of the Wigtown Book Festival and thank you to everyone who's, who's come tonight. Um, this is a particularly special year for us. As many of you will know, it's a year of Scotland's stories. Um, well, actually, it's Scotland's year of stories. They keep changing it. Um, and and that's a theme year um, in which across the nation, um, organisations, individuals, artists, researchers are going to be exploring the stories that make Scotland and the stories of the people of Scotland. Um, and we're going to be bringing you a programme throughout the year from Scotland's National Book Town. Uh, we've got a couple of great events coming up um, in March with Louise Welsh, the novelist, talking about her novel, The Second Cut, and Claire Hunter, the historian talking about embroidering her truth, which is a wonderful new biography of uh, Mary, Queen of Scots um, and of her times, which looks at her life, tells the story of her life through embroidery and the messages that she was sending. But throughout the year, we're going to have lots of events coming up. So, so please stay, stay with us. And we are delighted to be starting close to home in Galloway. And I'm particularly delighted to be uh, welcoming Adrian Maldonado here today. Hello, Adrian. Hello, now, Adrian. What I would do is show a copy of Adrian's book, Crucible of Nations, to you, but because I only have a digital copy, I can't do that. But I have to say, it is the most beautifully illustrated, wonderfully researched, detailed, rich, warm book. And what he's done is he's, he's taken this portrait of a, a period which some of us think we know a little bit about, sort of early medieval period and very gently he's told us that maybe we don't know as much as we think we do that maybe viking the viking era uh, the era when scotland as a as a nation was coming together or, or the various nations that made up what we now call modern scotland were forming into something larger that, that this was a more complicated situation than the classic stories that, that we know and he does it in this way that is is I, I think very sort of it's, it's beautifully challenging, but it's also very kind of humble. It's never kind of shouty about sort of people used to think this, but now we think that. One of the things that Adrian said, which I really liked from from something he wrote earlier this year, he said uh, early last year, he said, I'm particularly interested in the way myth and memory become sedimented on the landscape over time. And there is that real rich interest there in people's lives. Um, of course, as well as being uh, a figure of national importance, you know, he's, he was the Glen Morangy Fellow at um, the National Museum of Scotland. He's now got a wonderful title of the Galloway Horde Research Fellow, also at the museum. Adrian's really increasingly well known to us in Galloway uh, for the amount of time that he spent down in Whitton and particularly researching uh, researching the the, 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 the the unknown history, there, really revolutionising what we think about Whitton and the Canada Casa. So um, how this is going to work tonight is Adrian's going to talk for half an hour, 35 minutes, and then we're going to hand over. I'm going to ask him some questions. I hope you are going to ask him some questions so that I don't have to have to talk all the time. Um, tonight's event is like almost everything that we do online is free. Um, please, though, if you are able to, please make a donation uh, we want to keep these events free online. We think it's really important in the year of Scotland stories to be telling our stories, not just in Scotland, not just in Dumfries and Galloway, but across across the world. And we can only really do that with a little bit of financial support because the events still do cost money to put on. The last thing I should say is Adrian has very kindly, um, he's very kindly given us three signed copies of his books to give away um, tonight. And you'll see in the chat on this event um, that there is, um, you, you know, there's a, a link dropped in the form. And if you want to put your details in there, we will at random select three people who get a copy of this beautiful, beautiful book. So I'm going to hand you over to Adrian. Thank you very much, Adrian, for coming tonight, for giving your time. And what a great way to start our Year of Scotland Stories 2022 programme. OK, great to be here. Uh, I hope everybody can hear me okay, and if not, somebody please do tell me or else I'll just ramble on here in silence. Uh, but yeah, so let's um, see if I can get these slides up on the screen. There we are. Okay, 
today, I'll tell you a little story then to kick off this year of stories about Galloway in the Viking Age. Now, Adrian referred to in the in, in his in his his great introduction just then that we're talking about Scotland, but this book that I've written, The Crucible of Nations, is not about just Scotland. Scotland is the area that we're looking at because it's a modern nation state with its own national museum and its collection covers material from what is now the country called Scotland. And when the project began, we had conceived of it as creating a nation, a single thing. But then as soon as you start to look at this time period, you realize that the ninth to the 12th centuries, the Viking Age, and the beginnings of the nation, the kingdom called Alaba, they were only two parts of what we now call Scotland. There were parts of Norway, Ireland, England, uh, Man, and what we now call Scotland in this territory north of the border now. And we thought creating a nation is too limiting. It's the crucible of nations. And one of these in particular, one of these kingdoms in particular, Galloway is one of the ones that sort of remained outside of Scotland uh, uh, for the longest. You know, and as late as the 12th century, there is a separate king of Galloway. Uh, and, and, and I think that's really fascinating, you know, because Ninian and Whithorn, who are associated with area, this area, become these national figures. Ninian becomes the national, one of the national saints of Scotland writ large. But at this point, and as late as, you know, the 1160s, perhaps, you could see Galloway really as a separate region. And so how did that come to pass? How long has this been a separate sort of place within what we now call Scotland? Uh, and to begin with that, that story that, that I'm going to tell really begins just before the Viking Age. Now, at this point, at the beginning of the ninth century, We've had the very first Viking raids. In 793, you get the first Viking raid on Lindisfarne. And just two years later, 795, the first raid on the monastery of Iona. Now, we don't have a documented raid in the major monastery in this part of the world, which would have been Whithorn at this time. But we know there must have been one. And the archaeological excavations show that uh, this Northumbrian minster that you see in this reconstruction drawing, you know, uh, the, 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 the grass perfectly mown and everything looking quaint and quiet. Uh, there is a catastrophic fire in the middle of the ninth century. And this doesn't mean that it was a Viking attack by any means. It's hard to prove that, but it's a catastrophic fire. These were timber buildings, so it could happen accidentally. But the timing seems right for uh, uh, something like this to happen. So even though we don't have a documented Viking raid, we know that there are Vikings in this area, just as there were in every monastery of substance. Every kingdom uh, is sort of uh, uh, subject to raids around this time, in the early part, the first half of the ninth century. Uh, and then things begin to change subtly later on. Uh, it wouldn't be very surprising to find that there is a, a, a Viking raid here at Whithorn and elsewhere. What we know about Whithorn from the uh, excellent excavations that took place there under the aegis of Peter Hill and the Whithorn Trust in the 1980s, and the 1990s, an incredible amount of artifacts, uh, 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 an incredible amount of artifacts came out. And uh, for this time period, for the Viking Age, Whithorn stands head and shoulders above any other site in terms of Viking Age material culture outside of the major longhouse settlements like you get in the Western Isles uh, or you get in Orkney or Shetland. Whithorn kind of stands alone. And so the narrative, the story that has emerged is that there is a catastrophic Viking raid at Whithorn. And then from that moment on, it goes Viking. But what you're looking at here is a mixture of things. These are all artifacts from the monastery of Whithorn in the Viking Age. Let's call it the middle of the 10th century. 
And what you're looking at is things that are certainly imported from a long distance away that were used and found in Viking graves, like these beads that you see here. Uh, and you've got uh, uh, these lead weights, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. You know, these are used in sort of Viking camps and Viking towns. And so Whithorn is no, uh, uh, it's no exception there. But this belt and this pin, these are things which are originally insular objects of dress. That is, they are the kinds of items of dress that are being used in Ireland in the west of Scotland. Pins with ringed heads like these and decorated belts, uh, decorated with interlace like these on your left. These are kind of being made in the Irish Sea zone. And in the time of the Vikings, when the Vikings establish a settlement at Dublin, Dublin begins to draw in metal workers and they are making dress items, not foreign dress items, not Scandinavian style ones, but insular ones, Irish style dress items, but they're making them for their new patrons. And they become so fashionable, indeed, that ringed pins like these become kind of the calling card of the Viking Age. Wherever you find one of these, you know there's a Viking who's been there, you know, or somebody in the Viking Age. They're so ubiquitous that when, uh, uh, when the Norse land in uh, Newfoundland, uh, in, in, in North America, one of the artifacts that was left behind was, of course, a ringed pin, just like this. But again, originally, an insular object, uh, possibly an Irish uh, dress, fa uh, dress fastener. We also know, however, that it's not all nicey-nicey. Uh, we know that there's violence. I've just mentioned the possibility of a raid there at Whithorn. And the records that we have of raids on Iona are uh, seemingly catastrophic. There are uh, massacres. There are burnings alluded to uh, in those records, OK? Um, and we have these incredibly distinctive burials as well in uh, the Viking world from Sweden to Norway to Ireland to Iceland. We have these burials that have dress items as if the people buried in them are dressed uh, to the nines for their funeral. And they're arrayed with certain kinds of objects. And it's not just anything that you find in your house. It's very specific kinds of objects as if to say that there is a ritual. There are things that are allowed, that you are allowed to be buried in or that it is appropriate to be buried in your Sunday best, I suppose. Except in this case, for men, your Sunday best often meant your best weapons. And it tells you a little bit about the sort of uh, 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 the violence, or at least the threat of violence at this time, where weaponry becomes the badge of status, a badge of honor. Okay? So there is no reason to sort of pacify the Viking Age, but it was not always a bloody battle when there were Vikings around. Again, the, uh, 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 the man who was buried with weapons and dressed there in uh, a churchyard in Kirkubri was also wearing one of these uh, insular style ringed pins. So this person has a foot in both camps, perhaps. Now, there are lots of small finds, stray finds, and even great big hordes that I'll talk about today. But What's interesting is the archaeology of the Viking Age in Galloway doesn't always look like this. It doesn't always look stereotypically Viking with weapons and runes and uh, uh, you know, uh, images from sagas and, and, and things like these. It quite often looks, strangely enough, Anglo-Saxon, Northumbrian, local, insular. And of course, Galloway in the 8th and into the ninth century, as we'll hear, is still part of the kingdom of Northumbria. And Northumbria at one point is one of the largest, wealthiest kingdoms anywhere in Britain. You know, it extends from Yorkshire to Galloway. And so this is an sort of a, a, among many languages spoken in Galloway at that time would have been Old English. And, uh, uh, and so there's no surprise then that objects and hordes like these deposited in the ninth century don't always look Viking-y right away. So this is the Tal Natru horde. It's uh, uh, in the upland area now 
you know it's in uh it's in the forest park now it's kind of out of the way but it would have been on a sort of a, a main overland route connecting galloway uh with the southern uplands and then uh to the sort of uh, uh strathclyde area beyond that okay so it would have been on a major road it seems out of the way now a hoard was deposited there and we can date it by the coins that were deposited in there to around the late ninth century okay and the objects that are found in there are uh, very ambiguous in terms of what it all means there's a lot of northumbrian material in here there's dress items there's coins that are anglo-saxon uh, uh there's coins that are mercian rather than northumbrian so there are things that have been brought long distances and nothing more so than this clipped coin that you see here on the left this is a durham it's a coin that is used in the islamic world in the islamic caliphates and indeed this one is probably minted uh halfway across the world from scotland now but this is a, an interesting one because it's the very earliest one from Scotland. It's almost the earliest one found anywhere in Britain. And we have dozens, if not uh, hundreds of, of fragments of coins like this now from uh, Repton uh, and from Torxey, I mean, uh, uh, which is a, a, one of the major Viking camps of the heathen great army. And this is the kind of context where these coins are being imported. It looks like they're bringing in silver in great amounts, probably because they're selling things down the line, things probably like slaves and captives as much as anything else. So when you see one of these uh, Arabic coins anywhere in Scotland, it usually means that there's someone who's plugged into these Viking Age trade networks, this silver road that takes you from Ireland, the Irish sea zone, straight the way to uh, the Baltic and the Middle East, uh, the Arabic world, okay? So there's a lot going on here, but most of it is Mercian coins rather than anything Northumbrian, which would have been, I suppose, the local currency. These are Mercian coins. And so there is something a little bit strange about this hoard, as much as uh, we have these foreign coins. Uh, among the foreign coins as well is a little tiny fragment of one from the Carolingian world, Louis the Pious. And we know the Viking Great Army, uh, the sites that we know were occupied by Viking camps at this point, have this really interesting mix of coins from all over the Anglo-Saxon realm. Wherever the army went, they were paid off or they extorted money, extorted money. And these were the coins that are circulating in great army type sites. The Durham's I've already mentioned, and these Carolingian coins come along with that mix, okay? There's even a couple of more that have been found across Scotland. And one of them is just across the county boundary uh, in Dumfriesshire, in the major monastery of Hodham. Now, this is a site that has not been excavated in the way that Whithorn has. <laughs> Uh, so there's no telling if there's been a Viking raid here, but this uh, clipped or broken fragment of another Louis the Pious silver coin tells me that there's possibly a Viking great army moving through this landscape. That's where these coins are starting to sort of enter the record. Okay, so maybe they ended up raiding or camping out in a monastery uh, at Hottam on the way to a monastery in Galloway and then made their way up the road over to Strathclyde, where we know that there were Viking raids in 870, around the time that this was deposited, but probably too early for the coins that we're seeing. Other things in this hoard, like I mentioned, are Northumbrian or at least Anglo-Saxon make. And what's interesting about them is that uh, they are dress items. They are things that are not really modified. This used to be the head of a pin. So that's been broken, perhaps. But this set of pins is a linked pin set, it's complete. It's just missing the chain that would have linked them together. And this strap end would have probably been one of a pair. And then this little bit of metalwork here is clipped off of something, very carefully clipped off of something to make this little inset lead weight. This is the kind of thing that you really associate with Vikings. It's used on a balance, a handheld balance scale. And it's used to weigh very small amounts of precious metal, probably gold and silver for payments. So this Talnatri hoard seems to be a small transaction 
that is being carried out either by somebody in the Great Army or somebody who is at least trading with the Viking Great Army and has picked up things like this lead weight and that Arabic, those Arabic coins. So it's either somebody who is in that camp uh, in one of those armies or somebody who is trading with them. Either way, it's really fascinating for what's going on with Galloway. And here's some more examples of lead weights and things like these that are chopping up insular metalwork. These used to be decorated buckets, shrines, book covers, and they've been chopped up and at least reduced to these little tiny fragments and then popped onto a little bit of lead to act as a weight. This one in the middle from Lancashire has been filled with lead. It's a really heavy uh, uh, object, really small, but quite heavy because it's full of lead. So the kind of payments that are being made with these weights, and presumably that's what the Arnside mount has come off of, Whatever payments are being made are large amounts of silver, okay? So there are big transactions taking place here. Presumably, and some of the hottest commodities in terms of the money that you could get are, unfortunately, human traffic. So it might be that that's what's going on here, mixed in with local dress items things that you could find locally, maybe even coins that were circulating locally. What I like about this one coin, though, from the Talnatri hoard, it's that it's not just a coin. It's been made into something else. You can see that it's been poked through. There's a hole, at least one hole, maybe two, poked through at one end. When you see two holes or one hole at one end of a coin, it's like it's been mounted to be worn on a, as a pendant uh, uh, of some sort, usually on a necklace, perhaps, or on a uh, a, a necklace of some sort. This one, though, has been poked through those two times and then has been poked through again with another mount. It's almost as if it was broken and then needed repairing. So that means somebody really wanted to make sure that they were displaying this one silver coin. And that's really interesting. It's not just, here's my coins, that's how much money I have. It's, I have access to these coins. I am plugged into the network that uses these coins. And we do find durhams that are pierced in similar ways. But this very distinctive piercing on two ends of a coin is something that is quite distinctive and that I found several more examples of across Scotland. And I feature it in my book. It's something that links in with the Great Army sites, but it seems to be something that is specific perhaps to the North and maybe to what we now call Scotland. You know, we have examples in Orkney and now in uh, uh, Murray, in the Murray Firth area, uh, as well as uh, on Loch Lomond and uh, here at Talnatri. So there is something distinctly northern about this use of coins. It's almost as if to say this is a part of the world that doesn't use coins regularly and is sort of displaying these coins almost as a sort of token of wealth, not for its face value as a coin. I think that's really interesting, and there's something uh, uh, different from what's going on in Great Army sites further south that is going on in, in the north. So there's still a potential for a Viking signature that looks regionally specific here in Galloway, and never more so, of course, than with the Galloway Horde. There's been a lot of uh, uh, talk about the Galloway Horde, but I can't not discuss it here. I am assuming that everybody, more or less by now, knows that the Galloway Horde is an incredible Viking Age Horde that is currently on display in the Kukubri Gallery. You can see it yourself uh, if you're in that part of the world uh, until July. If not, here's a little breakdown of what was found. A pile of silver uh, in an upper layer a larger pile of silver down below that, a ring, a cluster of arm rings with a bit of gold, and then a silver gilt vessel packed with strange things, okay? Uh, by weight of gold and by weight of silver, it is uh, uh, second, uh, sec sec the second heaviest in terms of silver in Scotland and the most gold of any Viking horde so far in Britain. Okay, so there's something outstanding and strange, not normal, not common about the Galloway Horde, but it, I think, really captures the Viking Age in this eloquent and unexpected way. So we have these piles of silver, and that we see in a lot of Viking Hordes. That's kind of the calling card of Viking Hordes of the 9th and into the early 10th centuries, piles of hacked silver bars and arm rings. Okay, and so that puts it in the mainstream 
even though it's a lot of silver, it puts it in the sort of mainstream of hordes. It just means it's probably earlier than most of the hordes of this type. Certainly in Scotland, it seems to be the earliest of the Viking hack silver hordes so far. Okay, so there is something early and special, but there is there are parallels for this kind of horde. And this is where these kinds of arm rings are found. These stamped and decorated arm rings are what's mapped here on your right. And what's interesting about this map and these arm rings is that they are Viking age, and we know that that's where they're when and where they're being used. All these hordes that are uh, include these arm rings are dated to about 878 80 to about 920 930. It's a short window of time. And what's interesting about it is that it has nothing to do with the rest of Viking Age Scotland as we know it now. There's none of these arm rings in the hordes of the Western Isles or the Northern Isles. So whichever the Vikings are, or whatever network they're plugged into that is supplying the silver, they are different, I suppose, or rolling in a different uh, different kind of uh, economic circle than the Vikings that would eventually settle in Orkney and in the Hebrides, okay? Maybe it's just that this is an early point before those places were settled in a meaningful way. And that's something to sort of explore a little later on because by 900, you would expect that the Hebrides at least, if not the Northern Isles, would have already gone Viking. Okay, so there's an interesting distinction there. And it's not the only one of these found in Scotland. There are now two or three other sites that have arm rings like this. Okay, and two of those three or four sites are within Galloway. So we are an early adopter here of this system. And I think that's really important. However, it's not apparently adopted necessarily by Vikings, okay? And this is what's interesting about the Galloway Horde. This arm ring is the only thing that's potentially from Norway in the entire Horde. Everything else is Irish Sea, hack silver rings, and one Irish brooch, and the rest is Anglo-Saxon uh, and even more exotic. Uh, but this is the only thing that's actually technically Norse. And it's a very simple kind of thing, which might have been made somewhere else. Okay, so what we're looking at here is maybe uh, something that is uh, a, a hybrid context. You know, maybe they are Norse speakers, but uh, with insular people among them. You know, the classic example of something like this is the Hunterston brooch, which is an insular object with Norse runes on the back so it has been owned by a norse speaker at some point but that norse speaker writing in norse runes is called malbritha which seems to be a gaelic name an irish name uh and so it's probably a person who is bilingual at that point so maybe maybe that's what we're looking at maybe somebody is plugged into the irish sea world is irish and uh norse speaking at this time it's not so simple Everything we know about Galloway at this point is presumed to be Northumbrian rather than Irish speaking. There is there is Gaelic in the landscape. There are Gaelic place names, but there's also Norse place names. And actually, the majority uh, uh, of what we know about from historical records is that this is still considered Northumbria. It's still considered England. So in the 9th and 10th century, this is described as the coastland of the Saxons and Britons. In the 10th century, it's still called the Saxon shore. Okay, And then from the 11th century, you begin to get new words. The king of the Rins is based in this area. So that seems to be a new development. And then in the 11th century later, in other sources, you're still getting uh, the Rins and Galway as two separate things. And, and Galway, the, the area of the Gaul Gael, the foreigner Gaels who are bilingual, like the Hunterston brooch, these people still seem to be in Kintyre, Aran or Butte or Ayrshire. And it's not until the 12th century that you get that word Galloway, a king of Galloway applied to somebody who we know is based in the modern county uh, uh, there. So there is a lot of change in the air, but this part of the world remains potentially Northumbrian, uh, English speaking, or at least multiple languages being spoken. Uh, um, and it's not called Galloway until a little bit later. So by looking at the rest of the arm rings, 
famously now in the circles that I roll in, in the nerdy circles that I roll in, famously, there are names inscribed on the Galloway Horde arm rings, and they're in runes, but they're Anglo-Saxon runes. And the names, as far as we can read them, are in Old English, not Viking, not Irish. The most complete one, uh, which is associated with the Horde on the same site it was found, uh, is Egbert, a very common uh, Old English name. Now, there's lots of other examples like the Hunterston brooch of signing silverware at this time. Uh, but it's interesting. One of them uh, 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 from Northwest England is marked with Norse runes. Two others are marked with Ogham. Uh, the one at the Hunterston brooch is marked with Norse runes, but, uh, but again, uh, it, with an Irish name in it. So there's a sense of not one, not two, multiple languages being spoken at this area. And that's what makes Galloway potentially the most, most multilingual part. Even if you were born speaking just one language, by the time you grew up, if you wanted to get around in the world and get ahead, you needed to know more than one, at least a working knowledge of two or three languages, maybe four, uh, you know, by the time uh, uh, by the time of the middle of the 10th century in Galloway. And I think that's what kind of sets it apart. There is a sense of flux and flow uh, in this part of the world, okay? And there are very old things, but everything else in the Galloway Horde, honestly, is... Anglo-Saxon, everything in that sort of inside that vessel, most everything, except for a couple of things, is really coming from the Anglo-Saxon world. One last name that's just been revealed, okay, uh, uh, um, in the news uh, just last month. Uh, one more item has been cleaned off, the textile taken away, and it's revealed us another name. Uh, we have coins, we have uh, Anglo-Saxon runes, and now we have, in Latin, a bishop called Kigwald. So this treasure is something that is, at least in part, coming from a church. But we know that everybody behind it, as far as we can tell, seems to be uh, English speaker, maybe a Northumbrian, maybe a local person, but whoever they are, they are plugged in to that Viking network for all that that entails. It means lots of silver coming through, access to foreign coins and foreign sources of wealth, but also potentially, uh, uh, you know, actively involved in uh, uh, darker dealings like potentially the slave trade. Okay, that's what's going on here. Uh, I'll move on from the Galloway Horde, but only just to plug that the exhibition is still running in uh, Kukubri Gallery. And if you can't get enough, or if you can't visit, you can buy the book uh, in any good bookshop uh, already today. Okay, moving on to the last few objects that I want to show you. There are bits and pieces of Viking Age stuff still to be found in the Southwest, still to be unearthed in Galloway. And these, this is a connection, this is a collection of sort of old and new finds now, an old find. This bell is uh, uh, almost certainly a sort of hand bell or at least the bronze casing of one that's been deposited in a moss. And we have bells that are found in hordes in Northumbria, as in on this side of the border. Okay, so this is uh, one of the sort of background noise of early medieval, of the early medieval period, uh, but potentially a deposit that was made in the Viking Age in the upland area, just like the Tal Notri horde. And this is a, this one on the left is a relatively more recent find. Uh, um, it was described as a penannular brooch. It's on display in the Stewartry Museum in Kukubri just now. But if you look at the back, it's clearly not a brooch. It's had these lugs on the back that have been filed off or worn down. It's clearly been a mount. And it's got vine scroll, which is a kind of ornament that you associate with Christian objects. So again, this is a possibly uh, a, a come off of a Christian shrine or reliquary. And that brings me then to this issue of Christianity. If the Vikings were busy raiding monasteries and raiding places like Whithorn, does the monastery then disappear at Whithorn? At Whithorn, it's the absolute opposite, and we have the best evidence for a church continuing to exert its power in the form of these Whithorn school crosses. These are very large slabs of stone carved with cross motifs and interlace, which are specific to this region. And they seem to be centered on the monastery of Whithorn, as if to say, Whithorn is not just on the back foot. It's putting these crosses in every one of the parishes 
that belongs to the mother church at Whithorn. It is exerting its authority over the landscape. And Whithorn is not the only church that's doing that. These Whithorn school crosses, like you can see in the middle, are very distinctive. But there's all sorts of funky crosses. These are two that are just in our museum, but you can see more. If you go to uh, Kirk Madreen in the Rins of Galloway just now, you can see a lot of these funky later Viking Age stones. It looks like there's kind of a free-for-all. There's Christian imagery, but it's drawn in strange ways with strange motifs. And there's swastikas which have not yet accrued that connotation that they have today. There's multiple crosses on these things, and there's graffiti. There's this sense of a sort of freewheeling period where Christianity is still very much alive, but maybe perhaps kind of under local control or uh, without a lot of oversight. And patrons can found their own churches and put up their own crosses for their own family. And that, this sort of local family church, is something that we know is going on across Northern England around this time. And it forms the basis of what would be parish churches. So in the 10th and the 11th century, the story of Galloway is very much about the formation of what we would call the medieval landscape, parishes, a church in every village where everybody is expected to go to church once a week. That's a big change that's happening at this time. And one of these crosses, one of these funky crosses at Kilmory still seems to retain the imagery of an old Norse saga, a bit of paganism thrown into the mix. It's got imagery that has been interpreted as uh, Sigurd from Old Norse myth underneath a crucifixion. So this sort of hybrid kind of monument. But this kind of monument with Old Norse motifs and sagas on the one hand, but Christian imagery uh, dominating the stone is also what you find just across the water on the Isle of Man. This is in the mainstream, as strange as it seems for the Rins. This is actually part of a larger trend at this time. Even burial with your clothes on isn't as pagan as we thought. You know, I showed you this belt uh, from Whithorn. We now have people buried in churchyards with weapons and with belts very similar to these, probably made in the Irish Sea Zone, whether at Whithorn or in Dublin. Uh, and we have people even buried on Iona and at Aldham at these monasteries with these kinds of belts. It seems to be that at this point, it was not just fashionable, but maybe a way of just showing wealth in a Christian mode to be dressed to the nines. This is something that has been taken from potentially that pagan world and adopted into Christianity. And Whithorn, we know, becomes this great workshop of dress items. And the kinds of pins that are being made there at Whithorn, what I'm showing you here are other pins from the National Museum's collections, from the Colbin Sands, uh, near to uh, um, in between the Rins and the Mackers. Uh, these are being produced in places like Whithorn and then being exported across to the Hebrides and the Northern Isles, you know? So this becomes a hub, not just for Galloway, but for fashions that are trending from Ireland to Orkney. And these little tiny fragments connecting to the wider world, all part of the Christian world. One of these fragments of porphyry, green porphyry, possibly have been set into an altar, one from Bar Hobel, a local church, one from Whithorn, a major church, and on the continent, these great gold and ivory mounted portable altars show you the grandeur of what these little tiles may have come from. These are like personal versions of these large deluxe things that are being made and used by bishops on the continent. Finally, Kukubri and Whithorn and all of these places are emerging into the archaeological record. There is 10th and 11th century archaeology coming from these places. Places they are emerging, they are becoming more visible at this time, but almost invariably, it's at the church where this evidence comes through the clearest. You know, it's the parish church that's forming. It's the sort of triumph of the church uh, out of this sort of maelstrom of Viking Age trade and slave taking and raids. You know, it's Christianity that kind of wins out.
And for all the links to the Norse world and the Anglo-Saxon world, it's to Ireland that people are really looking by the 12th century. They're connected by sea to the Isle of Man and to Ireland. And nowhere more so than here in Kukubri, where there is possibly an early church and responsible metal detecting in the last few years has turned up this incredible find. It's a crucifixion plaque, and it may have come from an altar cross or a processional cross, but the only place we find these is in Ireland. It's the only one that's been found outside of Ireland, maybe 11th or 12th century, depicting a crucifixion scene. So Galloway at this time, sort of the roundabout of the world, okay? Uh, fiercely independent, uh, uh, but there are things that are specific. There are Viking Age hordes and burials, but they are regionally specific. And if you study the Viking Age, if you study the formation of Scotland uh, and you study this part of the world, it'll tell you more about the formation of nations and kingdoms uh, than you can get almost anywhere else. I think I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Wow. Well, well, thank you so much, Adrian. That was, um, you made the whole period feel kind of both rich and strange and familiar at the, the same time. And some of these items were just, I mean, that Higwald, that piece of, 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 um, of, of metal work, I mean, you know, it's that kind of detail that you get in things like the Alfred Jewel, absolutely beautiful, really inspiring. Um, I'm going to ask you a really personal question first, which is, <laughs> and I'm sure a lot of people will think this, like, you're not from around these parts. Um, you're from Puerto yeah. Rico, I understand. So how did you end up studying, you know, Galavidian medieval <laughs> history? Oh, I mean, you know, the, 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 the story I usually tell people is that, you know, I, I read The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings at too young of an age and it kind of messed me up forever, you know, so I was just nerdy in that that way. And I uh, when I went to university, eventually it was to study the Middle Ages. You know, because I don't know, I wanted the real version of that. Uh, but while I was doing medieval history, I came on an exchange program to St. Andrews University for just one term in my third year. And I saw St. Andrews, the ruins, I saw the castle, I went on a trip to see the border abbeys, and it was over for me. You know, reading about these things in books wasn't going to be good enough anymore. So I graduated and I came back for a degree in archaeology medieval archaeology and the best place to do that uh, for Scotland certainly was Glasgow Uni. I got my degree in medieval archaeology and I never looked back. Excellent. Well, look, I'm going to invite um, our audience to ask questions. So please, if you've got questions, put them in the chat and they'll be relayed to us and, and we'll put as many questions as we can to Adrian uh, by the end. I'm going to start with one question, which is one of the things that you say in the book is you describe Galloway as a a place or medieval Galloway as a place of wealth and power. And I can say that those, those are not words that we generally use to talk about Galloway these days. We, we, we very often use the word backwater. Uh, I think that's, you know, it's unfair, but that's what people, people, people say. It's certainly not a particularly rich uh, region. What did they have that Galloway today didn't? I think w the, the key thing that Galloway has, I think, is access. OK, so at this point, we have uh, the latest in seafaring technology is coming out of Norway. OK, so they have these great ships and they are plugging into trade routes that take you to the Baltic and from the Baltic down the, the sort of Volga, the rivers of what is now Russia and Ukraine. And that's connecting you to uh, uh, the Mediterranean on the one hand through the Black Sea, but also the Islamic caliphates and the Silk Road. And people who have access to that uh, uh, are the people who are uh, able to access the most money and the most wealth at this time. Okay. And so anybody who is on a sort of a good harbor facing out to the sea that can plug into these uh, uh, transnational routes, you know, uh, that's the where you're getting power and status and wealth at this time and so these good harbors wherever they can be found beach markets uh, and Colbin Sands is a really good example of one of those uh, several of them up, up the Ayrshire coast what it is now and in the Hebrides these are the places which become incredibly wealthy in the ninth and 10th centuries piles and piles of silver and gold but Whithorn in particular, because it's been excavated well with a large open plan excavation, uh, we know that it had this wealth before the Viking Age. 
there are ingots of gold. That means they're making gold into little bars. That means so much gold is coming in that they're reworking it and then sort of putting it into gold bars and then sort of trading it along down the line. We have gold coming in and these ingots of gold are very rare and we have them at Whithorn. And things are being made in gold there because we know from the metalworking places that they're working glass, silver, gold. And before the Viking Age, Alcuin, who is a churchman in the Carolingian court, he is friendly with the bishop of Widhorn. They're writing letters to each other. So the bishop of Windhorn sends him the miracles of St. Ninian, a poem <laughs> in Old English. And he's so taken by this. He says, thank you so much. In exchange, in gratitude, I'm sending you a veil of silk to put on the altar. We think that means an altar cloth or something similar to that, but it is silk. It's coming from, again, at this point, the Carolingian world has the monopoly on luxuries like this. But just uh, a, a generation or two later, it's all monopolized now by the Viking uh, trade routes. That's where you're getting stuff connecting to the Silk Road. And that's really where the Vikings are expanding uh, most aggressively. They're expanding to access that foreign silver, these luxuries like silk, spices, and all these things. That's really where the action is. And Whithorn had access to all of that before even the Viking Age. And, and you describe it very much as a, you call it a gift-giving society, that that's one of the kind of basis of, bases of, of how people relate to each other. Yeah, definitely. I mean, this is this is how you got by. So there were things that you paid for uh, but it was mostly in kind. And in Scotland, we don't have coinage minted in Scotland until the 12th century. So until that point, you are trading in bullion in, from the Viking Age onwards. You can trade in weight of metal and silver bars and things like that. But before that, it was all in kind. And so it was an honor-based system. You got paid what you were worth in this sort of intangible social way. And the, you know, the, the, the richer the gift or the more important the person that gave you the gift, the more important in turn that you were, but also the more obligated you were to that king, to that <laughs> lord. And that's how society kind of got by. And, and these monasteries traded with one another, these rich gifts, as a way of sort of one-upping each other. But also, that's how you would get the exotic stuff that a church needs, like incense, like holy oil, like wine. You need to get those from these really rarefied uh, 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 long distance routes. So this idea of kind of social currency that goes beyond just economic currency goes beyond money. It's about what's imbued in that in in, in that object. You talk about um, another phrase that you use quite a lot in the book is you talk about an animated world, which I think is a really interested interesting idea. I know that one of your specialisms one of the things that you're most interested in is the kind of funeral rituals and the kind of mortuary uh, ar archaeology but what, what does that mean by an animated book what, what does that mean that people feel that objects have, have, have are more than just objects they're not they're not inanimate presumably yeah that's right no how, i how think i think I, I think this is something that we kind of associate with the pagan world. You know, we call it animism or something like this, where you believe that what we call inanimate objects have a kind of life force or spirit. But it's very much present in the Christian worldview as well. This is just something about uh, the early medieval world and much later on as well, that uh, objects are not just sort of decorated, but they're animated by the kind of animal arts that is that you find in this time period you know uh, and you can see it most clearly if you go into the Galloway Horde exhibition there is this bundle of arm rings where it's four silver arm rings tied together with a fifth one and that seems to be a, like a contract between four people or five people maybe, uh, and, and that sort of, that number comes up again and again with the hoard. There seems to be four different donors to that hoard, but the largest one is a double arm ring. It's two silver rings in one, and they end in these snake heads, and it's the tongues of the snakes that join together and coil those two arm rings together. It's almost like the uh, the dragon or the worm, uh, as they would have called it, uh, is sort of sealing 
that contract, whatever is binding these rings together, it is being protected by the dragon and you don't cross the dragon. You know, this is the sort of protective beast. And to find these kinds of rings with animal heads deposited in hordes, you know, there's a possibility that in one sense, if there's a, a sort of animal ornamented ring like that placed in the hoard, it's almost like a token of the dragon protecting the treasure hoard. But in the Galloway hoard, instead of having that, you have this incredible pectoral cross, this cross pendant. You know, so you have the Christian version and it's placed right. up at the top of the hoard, right at the top. So it's the first thing that they came down on when the metal detector has found it. It's almost as if that is kind of casting its protection over the hoard underneath. So it's not a pagan Christian thing. It's just part of the early medieval mind mindset. It's like, it's like you said, you, you've got to kind of make the Middle Ages strange you know mm. there there is christianity but it's not kind of the same as we would recognize it in every way they are speaking an ancestral language to ours old english but it's not quite the same as we would understand it. you know things are recognizable but still strange and cool and i think that's what makes them interesting i think you make that very clear in the book where you talk about sort of burial rituals and that you know the things that i i had always sort of understood that you know that you you know, some of these amazing tomb burials like Sutton Who, or I think there were some Carolingian ones where all the stuff's put in the grave and you think of it as a journey to a bit like sort of Egyptian pharaohs. And you sort of, your book sort of subtly undermines that. Says, well, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of not always like that. And even with the warriors, it's like, yes, the warriors take their swords with, the, with them in the tomb, but the swords are kind of broken off at the tip. And sometimes they're not even warriors. They're kind of kids yeah. who might become warriors one day. And at that point, you've got a very different, like, it's, it's a much more sophisticated idea of what they're trying to say by, by putting stuff in, you know, by, by burying stuff with people. It's not just a kind of literal idea of we're going to stick it all in there because they'll need it for the afterlife. It's yeah. something more metaphorical, maybe. And, and one of the most interesting things, you know, so if you're studying Viking burials and the Viking age right now, you're in a kind of golden age of scholarship. There's all this science and all this amazing stuff coming out. And one of the things that I've been taken by, uh, really struck by when I was looking at all these uh, grave goods is that some of them are Scandinavian and some of them are Irish and some of them are probably Scottish in the sense of local, Pictish, uh, you know, uh, uh, and, and these kinds of things. But now the, the science... Of, uh, of molecular analysis has shown that some of the people and especially a lot of the women who are buried in these graves are themselves, you know, uh, Irish and Scottish. They're, they're, they're locals as much as immigrants. And so there are people who are uh, taken up by this Viking age. You know, they see the opportunities. They're either pressed into service, right? Taken hostage and made into Vikings. Yeah. But I, I don't think that's sustainable. I think after a certain point, some people do get swept up in it. And I think what's going on in the Galloway Horde, you might be seeing kind of a give and take. They're trading with the Viking Irish Sea with that silver, and they're taking that stuff up, but they're keeping their English names and, 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 and things like these, and these English brooches that are, sorry, these Anglo-Saxon and uh, uh, True Hiddle style brooches, you know? And so they've kind of got a foot in both camps. And I think the more you look at the Viking Age in Scotland, that's the story almost everywhere. Yeah, I, I think the science is really interesting. It, I, mean, I don't think it's time to go into it now, but I think it's really, really interesting within the book. It is like kind of medieval CSI, you know, you're kind of tracking down these people through. Um, I'm going to come to a couple of questions from, from the audience. Um, question from Sharon, who is in the northwest of England, and she says, do you see Viking links with northwest England from the map showing hordes? What oh, Vikings? absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, some of the largest hordes of silver are actually in uh, what, what's now Lancashire, you know, uh, 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 and, uh, and you know, uh, it's right down the coast. You know, it's an easy sail uh, to the Isle of Man as it is to Cumbria now. Uh, and so these kinds of places are really accessible uh, by sea. And we know that they're connected because the same kinds of objects are being found in these places. These little lead weights with a little bit of insular metalwork popped on the top. There's this great little, like a halo of them that extends from Whithorn on the one hand down to Lancashire. And if you put all of those together, this is something that uh, uh, my, uh, my, my friend and colleague, Martin Goldberg and I are working on. We've looked at the weights 
of these lead weights in grams, you know, and they seem to fall into a system that works in this local region, almost as if to say they're part of a single economic zone right. on this side of the water. And people on the Isle of Man in Dublin can trade with them, uh, but there is a sort of exchange that needs to happen. It's not the same weight system that is being used in Dublin. You know, so even just across the water, they're using the same objects, but there is a sort of local currency, if you like. The fact they're weights, is, is, so these are used for measuring silver, for example, or presumably, yeah. yeah I mean, presumably. they're being they're being put on these little handheld balance scales, which are very small things. You know, so you can only weigh so much, and what it's looking like is that it's precious metal. Otherwise, you'd be talking these big, great butcher's scales, you know, and steel yards. Uh, but you're not seeing those. You're seeing these little handheld ones. So these are small amounts. Uh, uh, but in some cases, like the Galloway Horde, you know, there are huge, huge amounts of silver being put onto these. Okay. Laura, um, Laura asks what I call a kind of desert island disc question. Um, <laughs> out of all these amazing objects and the photography in this book, which I would normally pick up at the moment, but actually Adrian is pretty good at selling himself through um, the <laughs> photography is it's founding in this book. Out of all these objects, what is your what's the one that you'd take to a desert island? Oh, that's a tough one. I mean, what what do you want to do with it on the desert island? You know, that's the thing. <laughs> do you want to remember the glory days, or do you want to sort of preserve something for later? I don't know. I mean, the 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 most iconic object I think in the entire book. Uh, you know, the Hunterston brooch is on the cover and it has a lot of information in it. But for me, the West Ness brooch is kind of a miniature version of the Hunterston brooch. It's a pin size version of that, but no less ornate. It's got amber and red glass and the gold filigree is just so it's almost microscopic, the detail that you've got on it. So someone's tried really hard to make this thing and it was not destroyed or melted down in the Viking Age. It was kept for at least 100 years, if not more. And when we find it, when archaeologists found it in 1963, it was in a woman's burial. It was a woman who had possibly died in childbirth, and she was about 30 years old or so, you know, so she was a young, a young woman, and she was buried absolutely to the nines. She's wearing these Scandinavian oval brooches, but almost everything else, you know, is coming from the islands, you know, it's just a mix of things. And then the beads around her neck are from absolutely everywhere. There's Middle Eastern things, there's Frankish beads. This, uh, this person is wearing Northumbrian strap ends, this lovely sort of brooch pin uh, of gold and, and, and amber. And it's something that's been kept for a long time. This is a person who is very clearly dressing in both ways at once, in that insular mode, but also the Scandinavian mode. And the woman in that cemetery at West Ness in Orkney, uh, a lot of them have been tested in this biomolecular way, which reveals that a lot of the women in that cemetery are insular. They're Irish or Scottish or even Northern Northumbrian, maybe Pictish, you know? They're certainly not from Scandinavia, these people, uh, the woman in that cemetery. So this woman probably is somebody who is a powerful woman in her own regard. And the Viking, presumably who she's married to, has married into wealth, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and we usually see it the other way around. We usually see it as the Vikings, take your trophy wife mm -hmm. and dress her up as a Viking. It, it's the opposite here. And I think that little object is sort of emblematic, I think, of how we can look at these things in all these different ways. You've got a really, interesting line in the book about you you talk about um being interested you know, that, that in a sense the study of uh medieval history has been very interesting the study of peoples and you say well actually not really peoples it's, it, that's kind of almost obscured people and how people related to each other and you also say parallel to that that you say well um life at this time in terms of different peoples it wasn't a mosaic and it wasn't a melting pot. And we'd, think of, we'd normally think about how people come together as one of those two things. What exactly do you mean by that? Because I think it's a really interesting concept that it is a more yeah. complicated thing. Than I yeah, we, we, sort of, we sort of agonized over this. But, you know, there, you, this period really lends itself to using metaphors and sort of metaphorical language to describe it. You want to say it's like 
this. And the, the thing that you want to say for Galloway specifically, where there's four or five languages being spoken at the same time, and we know that from the Galloway Glens project, uh, my friend Gilbert Marcus, who's done a lot of lectures around the area uh, and is reading and, and, and reading the map for the place names. And you can see that there's Anglo-Saxon, British, uh, Gaelic, uh, uh, and uh, Norse, and possibly even Danish all being spoken in this area and 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 spoken enough that those names are coined you know and i don't think it's enough to call it a melting pot because i think you know at the end of the day you are still born with a language there's the language that your parents read you stories in and they sing to you with you know the kind of stories that they tell you and you acquire those other languages as you move through the world you know uh, uh, and I, I think there there is still you know language is still kind of the thing that maybe defines you but it's not unchangeable either i grew up a spanish speaker you know that was my first language and these days i have an american accent despite growing up in puerto rico you know so in a single lifetime that can change but it doesn't make it doesn't melt the Puerto Rican away from me if I've changed my language in my own life because of my socio-political circumstances. You know, uh, uh, I am still a Puerto Rican first, and everything else comes after. Scottish, increasingly, <laughs> you know, you'll never be able to tell. Uh, and I think that's that's something that we're coming to in 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 modern politics as well you know it's not that the sort of the it's not that everybody comes together and they start to assimilate it's that everybody comes together and you listen to different perspectives and you respect those different voices and you listen as much as you can of course it doesn't always work out that way and 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 i think it's it, you know so it it's it's more of uh, uh instead of everything melting together the crucible allegory is the one that we hit upon because we were working with metalsmiths, metal workers, and they said, there's different flavors of silver, you know? This is what my friend Simone Ten Hampel told us. There's different flavors of silver. If you add more copper in it, it gives it a different consistency. It gives it a strength, you know? You say you're diluting it by taking some silver away, but actually you're making that brooch stronger so it doesn't bend, you know? But if you add too much, it snaps. You know, and, and so it is silver, but it's colored, you know, there's different flavors, different grades of these metals. And I think that's more what we should look like. There are Vikings and then there's Gal Gale, there's the Men of the Rins, mm -hmm. there are Men of the Isles. And so there's a lot of variation here. There are a lot of alloys. I think. Oh my word, there's a lot to talk about here. And I'm, I'm fascinated by all these kind of modern parallels and the where kind of reality starts, where reality ends and kind of meta, the relationship between reality and metaphor here and, and, and how you're using the modern world to interpret the ancient world and vice versa. Um, I'm going to bring it home though, bring this event home in all sorts of ways to, to Galloway. And I'm going to come to a final question from the audience. It's a question from number two guy. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I think number one guy probably couldn't be here tonight that's fine, that's um, fine. and number two guy says what led to the decline of this particular golden age of, of galloway i don't know really i don't I, I i don't i don't know that that there's there's necessarily a decline in the sense of the fame of galloway continues again uh whithorn one of the most important monasteries uh, and its saint, Ninian, becomes one of the most uh, critical saints. You get some of the earliest boroughs, that is, the, uh, the first urban centers, the first towns in Scotland are these market towns. And the, I showed a slide, but I flew past it really briefly, of Kirkubri. There's finds in the Stewartry Museum, and one of them is this 11th century papal bulla that is found in a burial. You, you do find these in burials sometimes, almost as like a, an amulet or a good luck charm or something. Um, and it, it's an 11th century one, 1040. And there's other bits and pieces that have been metal detected and reported through the treasure trove process, crucially, so that we know about them. Uh, and there's a lot of early material coming out of Kukubri, 
and in halos around the early burrows like Dumfries, like Whithorn. And that's where you're getting the earliest coins. That's where you're getting these incredible, uh, the crucifixion plaque that I showed you from Kukubri, probably as early as the 11th century, that one. Um, these places, the first towns are forming here. So I don't think there is a sense of decline simply because there are less, there are fewer objects made of gold that are sort of coming out of the ground. I think there is uh, this place, this area continues to be very important uh, from that perspective, not just from a sort of economic perspective, fr from a spiritual perspective, from that perspective of connecting you to the Irish Sea as much as the Hebrides, you know, uh, the seaways beyond that. I think this place remains uh, quite important for a long time. Well, that's that is what a what a great place to end with the idea of Galloway still as the as 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 the, the oh I, I've of just world. I've just seen I've just seen a comment from Kennedy uh, from Kenny here uh, it's uh, number two guy is Aiden who works at the Whithorn Trust rebuild team if you're not following the Whithorn Trust page on Facebook you're missing out on the incredible things that the rebuild right. team are doing right there right now I'm gonna go visit in the next couple of weeks and I suggest you do the same it's, sadly there are loads and loads and loads of other questions that we we just simply don't have time to get to tonight and I'm I'm sure if you can track down Adrian, you can you you can ask him. I think I I want to thank. Well, there are lots of people I want to thank tonight. Um, first of all, I want to thank um, Event Scotland and Year of Scotland Stories for supporting uh, this event, and I'd like to thank Bailey Gifford for also supporting our digital program throughout this year and over the past two years. Uh, they've been inval invaluable. But most of all, I'd like to thank Adrian for for coming here tonight, for giving his 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 time. Um, and also just for the for the perseverance with which he's kind of come to Whithorn and he's really just he's put a new sheen on on the area he's put a new sheen on Galloway and and I think we're all really grateful for that so um if everyone could give Adrian a, a, a digital hand clap I don't know quite how one does that these days I'll just I imagine it I can imagine you doing that and please um, we will be doing lots more of these Wigtown Wednesdays and other events throughout the year of stories. We'll also be doing a parallel program in Dumfries, working with um, the new National Centre for uh, Children's Literature and Storytelling at Mowbray House. Uh, so we'll be having some interesting events coming out of there. Please join us throughout the year. Please also have a look at the Year of Stories website, because throughout the country. There are so many fascinating things going on, so many fascinating stories to be told. Um, thank you for coming tonight. Thank you, Adrian. Um, good night. Thank you, everybody.